Okay, Mason, let's read a few more stories out of Town Mouse and Country Mouse and Other Tales. Let's see what we can find. There. Um, Some of these aren't very long. Here, let's start with The Princess and the Pea. That's like the pea that we grow in our garden. Once upon a time, in a far-off kingdom, there lived a prince, and he wanted a princess. But then she must be a real princess, and he traveled right round the world to find one. But there was always something wrong. There were plenty of princesses, short ones, tall ones, fat ones, thin ones. But whether they were real princesses, he had great difficulty in discovering. There was always something which was not quite right about them. So at last he returned home again. And he was very sad because he wanted a real princess so badly. Well, one evening there was a terrible storm. It thundered with great flashes of lightning, and the rain poured down in torrents. <gasps> storm, storm, storm. Indeed, it was a fearful night. And in the middle of the storm, somebody knocked at the palace gate, and the old king himself went to open it. It was a princess who stood outside, but she was in a terrible state from the rain and the storm. The water streamed out of her hair and her clothes. It ran in at the top of her shoes and out at the heel. But she said that she was a real princess, and she had heard that the prince would only marry a real princess and no one else. Well, we shall soon see if that is true, thought the old queen. But she said nothing. She went into the bedroom, took all the bedclothes off, and laid a pea on the bedstead. And then she took twenty mattresses and piled them on top of the pea, and then twenty feather beds on top of the mattresses. This was where the princess was to sleep that night. And in the morning they asked her how she had slept. Oh, terribly bad, said the princess. I have hardly closed my eyes the whole night. Heaven knows what was in the bed. I seem to have been lying upon some hard thing, and my whole body is black and blue this morning. It's terrible. They saw at once that she must be a real princess. After all, she had felt the pea through twenty mattresses and twenty feather beds. Nobody but a real princess could have such delicate skin. So the prince took her to be his wife, for now he was sure that he had found a real princess, and the pea was put into the museum, where it may still be seen, if no one has stolen it. <laughs> uh, this story is called Tom Tit Tot. Once upon a time there was a woman, and one day she baked five pies. But when they came out of the oven, the crusts were rock hard. So she said to her daughter, Daughter, dear daughter, put those pies on the shelf and leave them there a little, and they'll be all right. But the girl said to herself, Well, what's the use of that? I'll eat them up now. And she set to work and ate them all up. And when evening came, the woman said, Go and get one of those pies. I'm sure the crust will be soft now. Well, the girl looked and found nothing but the empty dishes. Back she came and said, No, they are not soft yet. Not one of them, said the mother. No, not one of them, said the daughter. Well, whether they are soft or not, said the mother, I'll have one for supper. But you can't, if they're not soft, protested the girl. But I can, said she, 
go and bring the best of them. Best or worst, said the girl, I've eaten them all up, so you can't have any. Well, the woman was wholly beaten, and she took her spinning wheel to, do, to the door to spin, and as she spun, she sang. My daughter has eaten five, five pies today. My daughter has eaten five, five pies today. And walking down the street at that very moment was the king himself. And when he heard her sing, he stopped and said, What was that you were singing, my good woman? Well, the woman was ashamed to let him hear all about her daughter's greed. So she sang instead, my daughter has spun five, five skeins today. My daughter has spun five, five skeins today. My stars, said the king, I've never heard of anyone who could do that. Look here, I wish for a wife, and I'll marry your daughter. But, he added, eleven months out of the year she shall have all she desires, but the last month of the year... She must spin five skeins every day. Hmm. Otherwise, I'll throw her out. The woman agreed, for she knew what a grand marriage that would be. And as for the five skeins, well, when the time came, she would think of something. So they were married, and the girl had everything she desired. But when the twelfth month drew near, she began to worry about the schemes, for not a word did the king say. However, on the last day of the eleventh month, he took her to a room she had never seen before. Now, my dear, he said, You'll be shut up in here tomorrow with some food and some flax, and if you haven't spun five skeins by night, out the door you will go. And he left her in a room with nothing but a spinning wheel and a stool. Well, the girl was terrified and started to cry, for she had never even learned how to spin. Well, suddenly there was a bang and a puff of smoke. And the next thing she saw was a little black imp with a long tail walking through the door. What are you crying for? it asked. Well, she said, it won't do any harm to tell you, so it won't do any good either. And she told the imp all about the pies and the skeins and everything. Look, said the little imp. I shall come to your window every morning, take away the flax, and bring it back, spun at night. What's your pay? she asked. Well, the little imp looked out of the corner of his eyes and said, Three attempts you shall have nightly to guess my name, and if you haven't guessed it before the month is up, you shall be mine. Ah. Oh. Well, every day the flax and the food were brought, and every day the small imp came morning and evening, and she never managed to guess its name. And on the last day, but one, the king came in and said, Well, my dear, you are progressing so well, I have decided to dine here with you tonight. And as they ate their supper, he began to laugh. <laughs> What is it? she said. Ha, 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 why, I was out hunting today, and I got to a place in the wood I had never seen before, and I heard a sort of humming in an old chalk pit. So I got off my horse and took a look. Well, what should be there but the funniest little imp you ever saw? It had a little spinning wheel and it was spinning like fury and twirling its tail. And as it spun, it sang, Nimmy, nimmy, not, my name's Tom Tit Top. And when the girl heard this, she could have jumped for joy, but she didn't say a word. And the next day, the little imp looked very full of malice when it came for the flax. 
What's my name? it said. It is Solomon, said she, pretending to be afraid. No, it isn't, it said, coming farther into the room. Is it Zebedee? said she. No, it isn't, said the imp, uh, uh, laughing and twirling its tail so fast that you could scarcely see it. But now she looked at it and pointing her finger at it said, Nimmy, Nimmy, not your name's Tom Tit Tot. Oh, and when the imp heard her, it shrieked frightfully, Ay! and flew away into the dark. And she never saw it again. <laughs> the Ugly Duckling. It was summertime, and the wheat was golden, and the oats still green, and the hay lay stacked in the rich, low-lying meadows, where the stork was marching about on his long red legs. In the sunniest spot stood an old mansion, overlooking a deep lake, and great dock leaves stretched from the walls of the house right down to the water's edge. Some were so tall that a small child could stand upright under them. And buried in amongst the leaves was a duck, sitting on her nest of eggs. At last, one egg after another began to crack and hatch, and the chicks started poking their heads out. Quack, 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 said the mother. I suppose you are all here now. No, I declare the biggest egg is still there. How long is this going to continue then? She said as she settled herself back on the nest once more. And finally the big egg cracked and hatched. Cheep, 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 said the young one as he tumbled out. Oh, what a monstrous big duckling, exclaimed his mother. None of the others looked like that. Well, the day was a gloriously fine one, and the sun shone brightly on all the green dock leaves as Mother Duck led her new family down to the lake. Splish, splash, into the water she sprang, and one duckling after another plopped in after her. Immediately the water dashed over their heads, but up they came and floated about quite beautifully. Even the big duckling, <coughs> ugly one, <coughs> even the big ugly gray one swam about with them. Next, she took them into the farmyard where they witnessed a fearful fight, for two families of ducks were scrabbling over the head of an eel. In the end, the cat captured it. Well, that's how things go in this world, said the mother duck, and she licked her bill, for she would have loved to gobble up the eel's head herself. The other ducks were not happy with the new invasion. Just look what we have to put up with, as if there were not enough of us about already. Oh dear, oh dear, look at that ugly duckling, one of them muttered as he flew down and bit him in the neck. Let him be, said the mother. He is doing no harm. But the poor duckling was made fun of by ducks and hens alike. He's too big, they all said, and the indignant turkey cock puffed himself up like a vessel in full sail till he became quite red in the face. And the poor duckling was at his wit's end. He did not know which way to turn. And every day things grew worse and worse. The duckling was chased and hustled, bitten by the ducks and pecked by the hens. Even his brothers and sisters abused him and jeered at him. Oh, if only the cat could get hold of you, you hideous object. At last he could stand it no longer, and off he ran straight over the hedge, where he so frightened the little birds, they all disappeared. Oh, this is because I am so ugly, he thought, the poor duckling, 
and on and on he ran until he came to a great marsh where the wild ducks lived. Tired and miserable, he stayed there the whole night long without moving. And in the morning he hobbled towards a tumble-down little cottage where an old woman lived with her cat and her hen. What on earth, said the old woman, her sight was so bad she mistook him for a large duck. This is a capital find. Now at last I shall have duck's eggs. <coughs> the old woman's cat liked to lord it over the duckling and bossed him about whenever he saw fit. Do you ever lay eggs? she asked. No, said the duckling quietly. "'Will you have the goodness, then, to stop all those quacking noises you make?' snapped the cat. "'Can you arch your back, purr, or give off sparks?' asked the cat another time. "'No,' said the duckling sadly. "'Then you'd better shut your beak when sensible people are talking.' And so the duckling spent most of his time alone in a corner. But one day he found himself longing for the waters of the lake. He simply had to tell the hen. What on earth possesses you, she clucked. Haven't you anything else to think about? Lay some eggs or take to purring, and you will soon stop these ridiculous thoughts. You're an idiot. There is no pleasure in having you around. I absolutely must go out into the wide world, said the duckling sadly. So back he went to the lakes where every living creature shunned him because of his ugliness. Well, autumn came and the leaves in the woods turned brown and red and the clouds hung heavy with snow and hail. And one evening as the sun was setting in wintry splendor, a flock of large birds appeared. The duckling had never seen anything so beautiful as these dazzling white creatures with their long, slender necks. And while he was watching, they uttered a peculiar cry, spread out their magnificent wings, and flew away from that cold region in the direction of the open seas and warmer lands. As they rose high in the sky, the ugly little duckling became strangely uneasy. He spun round and round and round in the water like a wheel, craning his neck up into the air in an effort to follow the snow-white birds. He did not know what they were, but he felt drawn towards them as he had never before been drawn towards anything else. Well, winter was bitterly cold, and the duckling was obliged to swim about in the water to stop it from freezing over. And every night the hole in which he swam became smaller and smaller and smaller, and in the end the water froze so hard he found himself stuck fast in the ice. Well, early the following morning a farmer rescued the duckling and carried him home. The farmer's children wanted to play with him, but the duckling feared they would ill abuse him, and in his fright he knocked over the milk pan. Milk spurted out all over the room, and in panic the duckling flew hither and thither, knocking over everything in sight. The farmer's wife screamed, Ah! The children chased after him, and the duckling flew out of the barn door, into the snow-covered bushes. And when spring came, the duckling raised his wings and found they flapped with much greater strength than before. And soon he could fly. And one day he landed in a large garden where the apple trees were in full blossom and the air was scented with lilac. Just in front of him were three beautiful white swans swimming lightly over the water. 
At once the duckling recognized the majestic birds he had seen last autumn. I will fly to them. They might peck me to pieces because I am so ugly, but it won't matter. Better to risk being hurt by them than to be snapped at by ducks and pecked at by hens or spurned by every living creature. So he flew into the water and swam towards the stately swans who darted towards him, their feathers ruffled. And as they did so, he looked down into the transparent water and saw his own image reflected but he could see that he was no longer a clumsy, dark gray bird, ugly and ungainly. Now he himself was a swan. Well, the big swans greeted him and stroked him with their bills. And as they were doing so, some little children came to the water's edge and threw corn and pieces of bread into the water. And the smallest one cried out, There's a new one! And they clapped their hands and danced about and exclaimed that the new one was the prettiest of all. He was so young and handsome. Well, he felt quite shy and hid his head under his wing. He did not know what to think. He was so happy. He thought of how he had been pursued and scorned and hurt. And now they were saying that he was the most beautiful of all. And the lilacs bent their boughs into the water before him. And the bright sun was warm and cheering. And he rustled his feathers and raised his slender neck aloft. Never in all his life before had he dreamt of so much happiness. Well, I think that's enough for this one. That's a nice story, The Ugly Duckling. Looks can be deceiving.